The chronological Bible reading for May 1st is 2 Samuel chapter 5 verses 1 through 10 and 1 Chronicles chapters 11 and 12. David was 30 years old when he was established as king, when he began his reign in Jerusalem. 30 years old, a relatively young man. But how long had it been since he had killed Goliath when he was a youth? Perhaps he was 13 years old when he had killed Goliath in exchange for having his father's house exempted from paying tax. When he was promised the hand of Saul's daughter in marriage, 17 years. It had been perhaps 24, 25 years from the time that David was anointed king by Samuel. Remember the story when Samuel went to Jesse's house, said, show me your sons. And after seeing the seven oldest boys, declaring that none of them were the one God had chosen, don't you have another son? Jesse said, yes, he's out with the sheep, likely with his older sisters, maybe as young as six or seven or eight when he was anointed king. I wonder if David, during this season of waiting, was wondering what it really meant that God had called him to be king. Maybe it was a metaphor. Don't we do that? Don't we rationalize in our own minds what something means while we're waiting for its fulfillment? Maybe God didn't really mean king. Maybe he meant a leader of some kind. Maybe it was representative. Maybe there was a metaphor there, and I took it too literally. There went my pride and my flesh again. The lesson here is that God in his sovereignty, in his wisdom, and his love is not trying to set us up for a fall. He is able to do immeasurably more than anything that we could even ask or imagine. If only we would submit to him and do the hard work necessary to become the person that he needs us to be so that he can trust us to steward well the calling that he's placed on our lives. I wonder if there were people around David who didn't know his whole story. Maybe people were living under a rock or something and they didn't understand and follow all of the events of 20 plus years that led to this time when David is finally coronated king. I wonder if some of those people would say he was an overnight success, that he was too young even to take the throne. Were there some people who detracted from him and said he's not worthy of it because they didn't see all of the hard work and the preparation that he had put into becoming the man of God that he was? I wonder if there were some people who were saying David was disloyal to the house of Saul, but they didn't know about the times that David could have killed Saul when he was in a cave, but he refused to harm Saul because Saul was God's anointed. In the same way, there are people who will question the calling that God has placed on your life because they haven't seen the hard work that you're putting in behind the scenes. They're not seeing the hours and hours that you're spending in prayer and in Bible study, the time that you're devoted to asking God and waiting for the answer on how you are to proceed. What's the next step, Father? What would you have me do? What things do I need to let go of? What relationships do I need to sever? What ways do I need to re-examine and change my thinking, God? When you launch into the calling that God has placed on your life, there will be people who don't understand because they didn't see. They weren't there with you in the 17 years of hiding in caves, of running for your lives, of delayed gratification. We live in a microwave society, in a drive-through kind of a culture where everybody wants to have everything their way, right away, the way they want it, when they want it. But God's kingdom isn't like that. You don't get to be microwaved ready in the kingdom kingdom of heaven. This is a slow bake. It takes decades for us to get to a place where God knows that he can trust us, many of us. There are, of course, exceptions like Charles Spurgeon, who began as a pastor of a local congregation at the age of 18. In 1 Chronicles 11, verse 9, it says, David steadily grew more powerful and Yahweh of armies was with him. He steadily grew more powerful. Even once he became king, it was a progression until all of Israel was under his control, until all of the surrounding nations looked on David with favor, understanding that he was the one in control and nobody could stand against him. I wonder if 
even David knew when he was anointed king 20 plus years prior that his kingship was going to be the ultimate fulfillment of Moses leading the people to the promised land, Joshua leading the people into the promised land, and David establishing the promised land physically under his kingship, under his reign. Could he have even imagined? A lot of times we don't dare to dream because we've been so hurt by unmet expectations, but I believe God is inviting us to dream. What would you have me do for Father, how do you want me to walk out the calling that you've placed on my life? What if our dreams were about the kingdom of heaven and advancing that on this earth? What if our dreams were about our own humility, our own selflessness? What if our dreams were about our own desire to lay down our lives for the benefit of other people? What if we aligned our dreams with the things that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer? What if we fantasized and imagined being physical fulfillments of Jesus' prayer for unity that he prayed in John 17. Yes, indeed, God is able to do immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask or imagine. Are we willing to partner with him? Are we willing to do the hard work? Are we willing to stop drinking? Are we willing to stop sinning? Are we willing to stop doing the things that he's been tapping on our hearts? You know the passage in Revelation 3 where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who will let him in? Imagine being home and hearing a knock on the door. Imagine looking at your ring camera and seeing that it's Jesus. Imagine what kind of cleaning up would you need to do before the company comes in. Jesus is standing at the door knocking, saying, I want to come in with you. I want to make you king or queen of this realm. Will you let me in? And many of us are saying, not just yet, Lord, let me put this dirty laundry away. Let me sweep the floor. Let me put the dishes in the dishwasher. Let me clean this up. I don't want you to come in and see how I've been living. Many of us have been worried too much. Jesus, I don't want you to see all these tissue boxes laying around because I've been crying, worrying about my children and my grandchildren who are prodigals. What is it that's keeping you from opening the door? We don't have to clean ourselves up before we let God in. We have to bring him into the process. We have to say, God, help me clean up these dirty laundry. Help me to pick up these tissue boxes and put the dishes away. Help me to clean my house and get it ready for you, God. I need your help. Because the truth is we cannot do it on our own. I could not have quit drinking unless God gave me that grace. It was his grace when I begged him to take it away. He sets us free when we let him, when we let go. I see in the life of David a letting go, his willingness to be a human sacrifice on the altar of God. And that's the message in these chapters that I believe is so powerful and so pertinent for us today. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for being on this journey with me through the Word of God in 2024. I am looking forward to connecting with you live via Zoom on Sunday morning at 8.30 Eastern. Thank you all for your thoughts and your questions. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.